Thank you. Can I do a carpet hug? Yeah. <laughs> Out beyond houses and mailboxes, roads and bridges, a person can see a realm that exists alongside this world in which we humans live. I say again, another world flanks the constructed one. Often the view from ours is skewed as through fractile glass, limited by narrow apertures of scope and angle and crack. We can't see it on demand. In the wild world, relationship is evolutionary, time, geologic, beauty, intelligent. There we find ourselves under a powerful spell. Thank you all so much for coming today to hear just a little bit about nature and writing about nature in the wild world. Um, I have, after almost 10 years, a new book of nonfiction, creative nonfiction. Um, it is a collection of essays that I wrote. In, in many ways, these essays represent, you know, almost all my thinking over the years. They are essays, they're not, it's, it does, this book doesn't have a narrative arc where it starts in one place and, you know, ends in this other place. It really is a collection. And um, as I was thinking about it, so, so the impetus for it was we get so much bad news in the world. Almost hourly, there's more bad news. A thousand manatees died in Florida in 2021. This year, so far, 1,000 starving to death because the weeds, the water weeds they eat are, are not growing in rivers like the Crystal River. All that bad news, and I wanted to, I wanted to make a book that was uh, uh, not a hopeful book, but a love-filled book. A book that represents uh, this other thing that I believe is more important than hope, which, which is just caring with all your heart and body about the world so that you every day get up and want to be a better person and live a better life for it. I also was looking at kind of, you know, documentation, like we're losing some of these things. And it, you know, like sort of, this is what I saw. And, and the other thing is, um, is travel. It's just, um, I think we have to re-examine travel. I, I was born poor, but I was lucky enough over a, a, you know, a number of times in my life to travel to see some wonderful things. And I'm, I'm grateful to that. But also, I, I kind of am leaving a record because I now have not flown for um, 13 years. And I, who knows, I may never fly again, I don't know. Um, I think the time has come for us to make really hard decisions collectively, but also personally about how we live our lives. When I turned 40, I, the only the, the present that I wanted was a trip to see the place in the Sierra Madres where the monarch butterflies overwinter. Um, I, I, ha I met with uh, Dean Sonia and her husband Andy just before uh, this, um, they both study monarchs. And so I'm really just reading a small section of this chapter for them. By the way, I'm gonna do a fairly short reading. We'll have Q and A if you like, but I, you know, just for co safety protocols and, and um, the fact that it's a gorgeous day, I won't drone on and on up here. When we, let, when we went to uh, Mexico, we had not been listening to the news. Suddenly, before us, the ground changed. Something had been dumped. There was a distinct line where a scrap heap began. I stopped, dead in my tracks. The material was papery, mottled gray, like pieces of printed material, not a trash bag full, but dump trucks of it. The ground was plagued with raspy gray shredding ahead of us, far to the left, far to the right. The air began to smell like an old bird nest. What is this? I asked Rodrigo, our guide. Las monarcas, he said. 
Every picture I'd seen, starting in National Geographic when I was a girl, when this site had been quote unquote discovered, through all the internet sites I'd consulted, monarchs clung to trees. Never had they papered the ground. These are the butterflies? Are they sleeping? They are dead, he said. Wings were paper printed with black words, dead. Hundreds of thousands of dead monarchs concealed the ground. Why are they dead? Rodrigo spoke in Spanish, and I was able to ascertain that they had died of cold. Twenty days before, there had been a killing snow. Over 50% of the monarchs at El Rosario had died. I gazed around as Rodrigo talked. Indeed, some of the flowering shrubs showed signs of frostbite, leaves and branches withered and brown. In some places, dead butterflies lay a foot deep. They are dead, I said to Raven, my husband, bewildered. Ahead, an old man scooped wings off the trail, as if butterflies hidden beneath the dead might yet be alive, if he might, as if he might bring them the warmth of the sun and save them from the trampling feet of the tourists who would not care what they destroyed in their haste to see a natural wonder and to say they had seen it and take pictures of themselves with it to show their friends back home. By saving monarchs, the old man might save his people, might save all of us. Jesus, I said to Raven, climate change, he said. How far up are we? I asked Rodrigo. He looked blank. How much farther? He shrugged, and I briefly wondered if he enjoyed his job. He started walking again, his boots coming down severely in the mulch of butterfly wings. The old man paused to watch him. Did the bent old man ever weigh the heart of a guide against the heart of a tourist? Did he weigh his own heart against Rodrigo's? The man's heart hung heavy, that much was obvious, as he raked the mountainside with his bare hands. We had not climbed much farther when Raven paused to point out live butterflies hanging in ragged gray masses from the limbs of Oyamel. Trees, trunks were wrapped with monarchs. The morning being chilly, overclouded, the, the butterflies remained enfolded, wings closed for warmth, clinging to trees and to each other. In the grayness of the cool forest, their, their mood seemed somber, as if only spring flight might repair their arduous loss. Below the live masses, dead monarchs papered the for forest floor even more thickly, a choking humus of powdery orange, black, and white leaves. Now the air smelled like the hold of a ship anchored at port and also like rotting pumpkins. The butterflies were deep enough to wade through, deep enough to drown in. We began to suspect that more than 50% were killed, maybe even 75, because there seemed to be more dead than living. We thought about the, what the refuge would have been like had the killing snow, snow not swept in, as if we, and as if we had been cheated, were flooded by a yearning to return another year to see the beauty en masse. But the mood of the refuge was shifting. Where the sun rays touched, living butterflies would begin to open their wings and color the trees like a Halloween party, and as the day ripened, they began to flutter about in dispersing clouds and cyclones and waves. Airborne monarchs moved in weather patterns. So I want to skip a little section here and just read you the very last. The best part came later, after we started down the mountain. The forest was sizzling now, the sun overhead. We began to enter a cloud of butterflies. They were waking, opening their wings in huge numbers. Where the sun struck through the canopy, branches of tall firs were set afire with orange. The butterflies dripped fire from, tall, from twig and stem as they exited their gray masses. The forest filled with fluttering, burning love notes, careening in crazy combustions through the iron green shade of the conifers. The monarchs were like brilliant origami. They were like flames released from the prison of a fire. They were gliding candles. I tried to think of other metaphors, but they were so much like, fly, like fire. 
hanging, they looked like ashes, dead. Flying, they glowed. The sun ignited them until the butterflies became messengers of sun, our only sun. That evening, we ate chicken feet soup in the plaza. For dessert, we indulged in a tutti fruity melange, something called a plantain split, a ripe plantain fried whole and topped with sweet cream, sweet cream, strawberry jelly, half a peach, and condensed milk. Afterward, we set off through the tight, jittery streets in search of pulque, a cloudy local drink made from agave, chewed in pieces and spit into urns to ferment. Our search brought us down an alley to a modest house that served as a store where a woman in a long skirt with eyes dark as vanilla extract laughed at our request and dipped two glasses of cloudy liquid from a pot. At sunset, walking, sipping, we came upon a cactus that we call Spanish bayonet, tall with seven trunks, full of house finches. Easily the finches numbered a hundred. Up on the mountain, as darkness fell, the monarchs drew together in tight principalities, each butterfly a bit of a bigger journey, its life a baton to be passed between Mexico and Canada and all the land between, a brief flare in an incredible inferno. Las Monarcas. And I want to just tell you that Sonia Sonia and Andy told me that they've made numerous trips to the overwintering place. And in 1995 and 96, they saw the butterflies where you could, in one colony, you could walk for 45 minutes with just butterflies everywhere hanging out. And that was just one colony. So they saw things that I wasn't able to see. I saw things that many of you young people won't be able to see. Also, I want to tell you that one of the lucky things that happened to me today, uh, among many, many wonderful things, was that I got invited to tour the Natural History Museum on campus. And that's where, you know, the teaching specimens of American eels. And um, when, I, when I read the word finches, um, I saw the drawer today just happened that, uh, to see the drawer of purple finches, including one collected by Eugene Odom um, at his home here in Clark County when he was alive that had hit a window and died. Um, you have a wonderful museum there with lots. I saw the, the drawers of cicadas. Um, I saw beetles, I, you know, it's, it's just, uh, an amazing, amazing collection of life that you have in that museum. I want to read you one more piece, and this is called The Dinner Party. I'm not going to read the entire piece. It's pretty long, but I, won't, I think you'll just get the gist with the pieces that I've picked out for you. Um, Richard Nelson is an Alaskan nature writer who lived, he was born in 41 and he died in 2019. And he was a friend of mine. So he's gonna appear in this essay and just know he's, he was an, an, uh, an anthropologist who studied with the Koyukon people. He wrote Make Prayers to the Raven and the Island Within about uh, his life with them. Um, of a month spent in Alaska. Deep in our history, every human was a forager. In fact, for 90% of human history, we foraged. Because they were mobile, hunter-gatherers could not amass capital. Agriculture is what allowed humans to settle down and store food. So the rise of agriculture was the rise of capitalism and I blame a lot of nature's destruction on capitalism. But even the luckiest, strongest, most intuitive foragers were poor compared to agrarian societies, at least in capital, though they were not poor in terms of strength and health, physical ability, and free time. We can think of human history as a continuum that moves from us being hunter-gatherers to agrarians 
to industrialists, to technologists, which is to say from wilderness to farms to factories to computer centers operated by robots. Modern day foraging is a plummet into the ancient as if I've been sleeping in fields of grain and now I'm awake. Nature writing has been called a marginal literature. If culture, our culture, is a set of stories we tell about life in a place and how to navigate that life, then nature writing is literature at, it, at its most essential. Its tenets are that humans are biological, that we are dependent on the earth, that places are vital to our psyches, and that humans have volumes to learn from nature. In 99, I was at Orion Magazine's Fire and Grit conference when environmental author Gary Nabhan, in a talk called Food and the Politics of Place, said that nature is not simply wild animals, plants, and land. Food, too, was nature, and much of our food arrives to us heavily fertilized and pesticided, waxed and gassed and irradiated, highly processed, genetically modified, from animals treated with hormones and steroids and from very long distances. Such food is hazardous to nature. Nabhan first announced the idea of local food, saying if it's grown closer to home, it's healthier and helps, helps solve the climate crisis. That was years before the 100-mile diet became a fad. Gary was eating food he brought with him from his Arizona domicile, dishes like cactus pad salsa and mesquite tortillas. He said he was using food as, quote, a metaphor to weave my life back together. If eating is an environmental act, I became an activist in Alaska. Or per perhaps I slid backward along the human timeline until I could finally see wilderness. And there's a space. The ocean was exceedingly calm and water lapped at Hank's boat. The day was sunny again, stunning, as if at any moment golden streamers and silver confetti might fall from the blue sky. The weather was unusual, Hank said, since Sitka logs 200 days of rain a year. Around us floated an armada, armada of beautiful islands. Hank said he wanted to take us to St. Lazaria, which I assumed was one of them. The jagged, snow-covered peaks of Baranoff Island towered in the distance. In front of us, something leaped like a disappearing parenthesis. It was black with white sides. Harbor porpoise, Hank said. Back home, we have bottlenose dolphins, larger than these cousins. Hank spotted blowspouts first. Gray whales, he said. By the time I looked, the sea was calm. Hank idled in the general direction of the spouts and cut the engine. Apparently gray whales, mammals up to 45 feet long, can stay down a couple of minutes between breaths. We sat still. Then before us a head crowned and an immense gray body rose toward the sapphire of sky. Another whale lifted from the ocean and rolled. We were close enough to hear whale breath released in loud pops, followed by an eerie ringing as they drew in air, then more pops. When they blew, fountains shot more than 10 feet into, above the sea in a forked shape, and for a moment, two iridescent puffs of rainbow-colored mist, palm granite and tangerine and azure, drifted down into the roiling ocean. The males were massive baubles, their sudden whale clouds kaleidoscoping against the black sand beaches of the distance. St. Lazaria is a pile of black volcanic rock no more than a few hundred feet across, thought to be the remnants of an ancient eroded volcano. It's hourglass shaped with a high wire saddle and two ends that rise in large cliffs. In 74, the feds designated the entire island a wilderness to protect massive nesting colonies of fork-tailed pet storm petrels, leeches storm petrels, common mewers, thick-billed mewers, tufted puffins, rhinoceros auklets. I didn't know all that then. The sea was unbelievably calm, but the closer we got to St. Lazaria, the crazier the currents got. 
Hank eased the boat toward the lee side, nosed her into a rocky cove, and told us to leap off. He retreated and stalled the boat, which had low, wide sides and a beautiful wedge, and anchored her in the cove by tying two cleated ropes to armfuls of bull kelp. The kelp moors to the sea bottom by a root called a holdfast, known to be incredibly strong. Still, our craft was only tied to seaweed amid lashing waves. From shore, we watched Hank lift a blue plastic kayak into the water. He was reared in Alaska. He had been on the water all of his life. Thor might have been a better name for him. Below our feet, St. Lazaria's basalt was smut black and almost fibrous with bu bubbles like petrified sponge. Pumice, I said to Raven, I've never seen anything like this. It was splotched with bright yellow lichens out of the splash. Tidal pools were marvelous little gardens of kelp, algae, anemones, limpets, and sea stars, both the true stars, which are up to a foot wide, and the sunflower stars, which are twice that. The three of us climbed to the sill. Below, the fierce blue-gray blue Pacific hurled itself against the basaltic shores, sending spray high. I can't imagine the ocean on a rough day, I said. In a snag, two bald eagles consulted. We stood listening to the gulls and admiring the handiwork, the intricate carvings of volcano and sea. A large pool directly below maintained the water level of ocean through an igneous corridor where water rushed back and forth. We scanned for blow spouts. Tiny Sitka had disappeared and the coast of Alaska was all wildness, all powerful, all bigger than ourselves. We didn't stay long. When the time came to go, Hank perched his kayak at the, e at the head of a little rocky canyon. Every couple of minutes, a wilder wave would come along and spew our feet, and if we shoved Hank into the retreat of one of those waves, he wouldn't have to clamber into a kayak being battered against a rocky shore. He went out without a hitch in a spume of foam and soon returned with the boat. Slowly, Hank looped the island. Melting ice dripped from cliffs. On the north side, a cave opened like a yawn at water's edge. 20 by 20, and Hank eased inside. When the birds are nesting here, he said, the smell is so strong you can't breathe. But this was April, and the cave was empty. It smelled musty, like old pantyhose. Absurd hot pink sponges clung to rocks at the waterline, as did more sea stars in neon colors. One flank of the cave was streaked with emerald green moss. Water dripped all around through crocks in the rock. I could barely notice these things, however, in my nervousness as each wave rocked the boat closer to the jagged rocks. After a minute, Hank squeezed out and we went on. Could I have ever imagined such a place? Could I see myself living with whales? Was I wild enough to enter such wildness which partners so closely with death? Had I accepted the diminishment of the world without a whimper? On St. Lazaria's ocean side, rock fractured into a cavern large enough to hold a brigantine. Along its many ledges, hundreds of birds, penguin-like, stood. They were mures, which breed in colonies in niches on sea cliffs. Even at our distance, we spooked them, and hundreds poured from the cave. Hank cut the engine. A treble of whirring wings resounded off the cliff as the mirrors took flight. In a panic, humans will stampede and kill each other, but there was no jostling with mirrors. I don't think any two of them ever touched wingtips. Each leaped off into space and flew out to sea in formation, then rapidly back, circling into the cave. A few hundred didn't spook, but sat watching. Another eagle surveyed from the cliff. How much life, I thought. How many hearts. Altogether, an ocean of blood and another of sap. A continent of bones. I love this world. 
I'm going to skip some sections here and head on to the end. But if we eat from a place, there's, so there's a space. If we eat from a place, don't we become the place? Isn't eating a direct way of filling ourselves with a place we love, of making it a part of us, of becoming it? If we eat wild food, can't we become wild? Can it get us closer to the heart of wildness? Um, even considering the wild abundance of coastal Alaska, I was unprepared for the meal that would be goodbye. It would be a simple meal, Carolyn said when she called with an invitation, but that supper turned into a four hour feast, the longest of my life, and would come to represent all my feelings about the entire earth. That meal was a crescendo, an arc of a bridge, and it in its shining, I could satiate my insatiable cravings for a wilder world. So I'm going to skip all the parts where we get together and, and what she's serving. And, you know, they wanted to know how the month had gone. And I'm going to, so let me just, just say what she, so she, they brought out these things that um, Hank had forged from a dumpster called, uh, cod cheeks. It's a part of the fish that's right under the eye. They're very difficult to get out in the, in, you know, in the processing plants. So they just throw them out with the heads. And Hank had gone and um, foraged these. We had smoked salmon that came from, you know, home fished salmon. We had uh, kelp. Um, we had herring eggs on kelp, just cut into little squares. Um, Dessert was uh, huckleberries from the land, some kind of huckleberry pie or crisp. Um, the diners, wait a minute. Let's, here I want to hover above a dinner table at the edge of Thimbleberry Bay. The moon is a day off full and ringed with the palest green. The moon illuminates the diners and reflects serenely off the water. A printed yellow cloth is spread and at the table's center, a bouquet of daisies, and on the table, eight cups filled with wine. Eight people lean forward, reaching toward bowls and platters as they eat the place they, where they find themselves and also reaching toward each other. They have teleported back a thousand years into a primal abundance in which humans evolved to an earth none of us have ever seen, but long for. When humans coexisted with herds of bison, gaggles of geese, coveys of partridge, and herds of deer, and also with flocks of Carolina parakeets so thick they blackened the sky and rivers boiling gray pink with salmon. They have reentered a primal abundance of story. And then a space. If you've read Nell's work, you can imagine what a happy, soaring person he was the kind of person who kayaks alone to an uninhabited island, has an experience where a wild deer comes up and touches him. And while reading the story years later in a college auditorium, he creates the same breathless, wheeling ecstasy. When I spent time with him that month in Alaska, he was in his early 60s, kept his hair cropped short, and wore glasses. So the degree of his wild nature was not apparent at first. One day, Nails had taken us out in his boat. He anchored in a calm bay, and we climbed a beach on Krusoff Island. He guided us, guided us into a muskeg, walking in deep indentations left by brown bears. He showed us the place in his story where the doe had come right up to him. On the ocean side of Krusoff, Nails nudged his boat into a room-sized cave at sea level the same as Hank had done, except Nails was less measured. The ocean was rough, the cave room-sized. Nails cut the, mo the motor. Behind us, the Pacific Ocean swept into the cave in ferocious waves, and before us, a merciless wall of rock wept cold tears. The heartbeat of the ocean swept us farther inside, wave upon wave, while Nails, an exuberant Pontus, laughed gleefully. Even with life's vests strapped over winter coats, we would not have survived. 
Finally, as we were about to crash, Nels switched on his engine and backed away. We turned out to sea. We went on and on. We saw any number of ravens. We saw Stellar's jays and golden eyes. We saw seal and sea otter floating with head and feet out of the water and then a single small arc of humpback quail. We saw the low gray sky, rain again, a sudden darkening. The far islands were shrouded in mist. And in all that, all the stories one needed for lifeblood, all the stories to sustain us. After that, I trusted the world more. I had seen what I had seen. If wild plenitude still existed somewhere, then it was not a myth and it could exist again anywhere. The dinner party. If it existed somewhere, it, it could exist again anywhere. Uh, Leslie Marmon Silco had that beautiful line in ceremony where she saw a hummingbird or the character saw a hummingbird. And it was just like, if there's a hummingbird, then somewhere there are flowers. And therein lies the hope, you know. Do y'all have any questions? I've kept you a little longer than, I didn't plan to read that essay till right before I thought I'm gonna do this dinner party. If you have anything you wanna say or ask, I'd be glad to try to, yes. So, um, I wrote them over a long period of time and just uh, had a long time then to tinker with them. Probably half of them have published in places and half of them never published. And I was just, some didn't publish um, because they're very long. Like there's one where I go to Costa Rica and, and I volunteer in a national park there for a month or whatever, six weeks. And um, it's a very, very long piece that looks into Duende, you know, like the spirit of Duende, which is the magic. When somebody, like when there's magic in the room and you feel it or you feel it in the work, you know, that's Duende. And I was really exploring this idea of Duende there in Costa, in, in Costa Rica. Yeah. But yes, over a long period of time with lots and lots of tinkering. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you for asking that. And I also know that you have bought every book I've ever written for your children because I always inscribe your books to your children to build their library. I remember your face. Thank you for coming. So thanks to Alfie for having me. Thanks to Dean Sonia and the other Dean Sonia. And um, thanks to the College of Environment and Design. Thank you all for giving up a part of this glorious day to come be together and be with me. I thank you, and I thank you for having me back to Athens. Let me just end with one paragraph at the very end. I travel, I take this kid, these kids into the Okefenokee, and I, I had to, one of them drank uh, some la lantern oil that I had ignorantly put in a Gatorade bottle. He just said, he was in my boat and he said, Miss Janice, can I have this Gatorade? And I said, Zach, you can have anything in this boat. So he drank this lantern oil, which involved, I thought he was, you know, I just, anyway, we got out to mile five. We were at mile five. I had to tie his boat to mine, paddle back to the landing, get help for him, and paddle back out to, to mile marker 12 where we were camping on, the, my party was camped on a platform. So it's about those, those moments, especially the moments after dark where I was just a single woman alone paddling through all these alligators and realizing that I had become something else, some kind of like warrior I didn't know I was. I was pretty much hailed as a hero 
but I was no hero. What I'd done was remedial, a defenseless mistake in a grand, heroic, mythic life, and I was lucky a remedy had been available. One of the most important poses in yoga is a warrior asana, knees bent and arms outstretched looking forward over the right fingers. It's a pose that requires strength and balance, training for both the physical body and the wisdom body to respond when we are called to action. The pose is also a bowing down, a recognition of limitations, gazing past the fingers we see both near and far. As my yoga teacher likes to remind me, you need more than a wish. You need burning desire and fierce determination. When I am in this pose, I know that I'm in training, learning to be aware, to not turn a blind eye, to not back down, to not give up. Sometimes the only weapon we have is awareness. Sometimes all we have is a little light that we can shine outward into a big darkness. And sometimes we tap into our superpowers and then we can transcend and bring about transcendence. Then we shoot flaming arrows. Most of us, most of our lives are asked to live small. Most of us quit trying very young to live the bigness we know is possible. Now, no matter what I choose or what is asked of me, I know what I became that long, long night. I paddled alone through shamanic darkness in the desolate wilderness just this side of the ultimate wilderness. I have seen the warrior. Thank you.